Welcome back, everybody, to another Transcontinental Party Pace podcast. Today, we were going to talk about the concept of diminishing returns. What is that point where when you spend more money, you don't get as much value back? Uh, once again, I'm joined by my co-host, Nolan, from the Bike Sauce YouTube channel. How's it going, Nolan? Pretty good. How are you? How's it been over there? Good. It's just starting. Uh, this week is uh, some Semana Santa, so Holy Week. And this is when they do all the processions and everything. And uh, we, Laura spent the day like running around getting groceries because like the, the town just like shuts down for the next week or so. So we're Got like, it. it feels like doomsday preppers, but for, <laughs> for Easter. <laughs> like at the start of the start of the pandemic. Yeah, pretty much. It's like <laughs> if you need t TP or or food, <laughs> buy it today because this the, everything's going to shut down for the, until like next Tuesday, basically. <laughs> oh, nice. Uh, and I was reading in your blog on Patreon that it's like the official start of tourist season. Yeah, I think this is a weekend that all the hotels open up. And there's like a lot of like British cyclists on vacation here. You hear a lot more English. Um, it's, it's kind of fascinating. Like there's more buskers on the street. Uh, some of the restaurants have raised their prices just a little bit. <laughs> so, you know, it's a season. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. So the tourists over there are all from, are they mostly from like England and Britain? Uh, they're, they're from all over. Like Spain oh. is like one of the most visited, uh, destinations. Um, like a couple weeks ago, it was, it seemed like there were just bus loads of like Italian school kids that, that went on break here. And oh, cool. uh, yeah, it's wild. Do you, I mean, I, I, I can just pick up on the, 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 the British English because that's what I can understand. Yeah. But yeah. Cool. Um, why am I so white and pale? <laughs> Sorry. Is that white balance? Is that white balance? I don't know. <laughs> they bother some. All right, we've got uh, our friend Aaron Vasquez here. Uh, Aaron just did a Ruta uh, do Jefe down in uh, Arizona, Sarah Swallow's event. Oh, cool. Um, how, yeah. So Alex, Alex asks, uh, no Irish cyclists? Uh, definitely, I feel like I've heard the Irish accent around. So there, there <clears throat> lots of English-speaking countries are, are converging in, in Spain. Cool. Um, <clears throat> Wow, Scotland too. Scotland in the house yeah. all over. Nice. So um, yeah, if you guys are just hopping on the live stream, we are going to be talking about the point of diminishing returns. We're going to go through the bike and uh, give our personal threshold of where that's just too much. I'm not going to, I'm not personally willing to spend any more uh, to improve said bike or said component. Um, but how, how are things been on the, the bike sauce channel? Uh, a little slow. Um, our kids were on spring break last week. Uh, we took, we went up to Big Bear to do a little bit of skiing. Um, my wife Karen took a hard fall and broke her wrist, so that's oh, no. not good. So she'll be <laughs> out for a little bit. Uh, my mom was having some issues. She's been in the hospital, but she's back home now. So it's been, it's been a, it's been a pretty busy couple of weeks. So I actually missed my upload this past week. Uh, which mm. is weird for me to just kind of take a week off, I guess. But um, yeah. hopefully I'm on track to get back on, you know, this weekend and moving yeah. forward. So everything's yeah. good. Just a little bit of a hectic past couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. 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 It feels weird taking a time off, you know, sometimes it's like, are right. people going to leave and never come back? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's weird because you don't really have a boss. There's no one to, no one's going to scold you for not uploading. Yeah. Yeah. The number, the numbers will, I guess. The numbers will. Every time you open up YouTube studio, it's like, get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, Google's your boss, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, cool. So uh, if you guys are in the chat, let us know uh, what is, uh, what's your personal threshold for a bike or a frame where you think um, if you spend more, you're not you're not going to get enough back in return. Looks like AI, Russ. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I feel like we should work. We should come up with a, a working definition of diminishing returns. Is there a, a scientific engineering one that you can uh, that you can well, give me? Can, uh, if I had to 
it would be a local maximum on the ratio of value per dollar spent is the way I see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the problem is the problem is it's hard to quantify value, right? Dollars easy, but the numerator of that ratio is the challenge. Um, yeah. Still yep. for any product, whether it's a complete bike or a component. Yeah. I'm always thinking in terms of this kind of, I, I guess bell curve is the easiest way to visualize it, right? There's some peak, where the value that you get per dollar spent is the maximum. And I think on either side of that, it starts to roll off and you, and you start mm -hmm. to get either diminishing returns on your investment for more money spent or not quite as much value per dollar at the lower end of the spectrum. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So I yeah, maybe we can work from, uh, I don't know. Just start with the big stuff. Start with frame, and then work our way down to components. Yeah, um, I think I feel like before we get into discussion, we have to say that you know value and budget are very subjective. Yeah. <laughs> right. There are some people that think you shouldn't spend more than fifty dollars or twenty-five dollars on a complete bike. <laughs> yes. Um, so we see you people, but this uh, our budget's going to be a little bit higher than that. I think at least. At least like 200 bikes, 200 bucks for a complete bike, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. If I'm not a little bit more. <laughs> I'm not sure where you could even find that these days, but yeah. yeah. I, I know a guy. He's behind the alley. He's got. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, let's start. Yeah, let's start with the frame. Uh, steel fork, steel frame. Uh, at what point do you feel like you know it's kind of peaked out, and after that, you're not getting more if you spend more money? Oh, steel frame and steel fork. Yeah. Because I feel like this would address a lot of the, you know, Surly, formerly All City, you know, Marin, right. yeah. uh, that kind of uh, class of bike, which I feel like both of us have, have reviewed. Yeah. So that's the thing. Um, those frames, like frames, frame set means frame and fork, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, I don't know. If I had to throw a number, I would say somewhere between the twelve to fifteen hundred dollar US mm -hmm. is probably where you're gonna get, in my opinion, peak value per dollar spent, right? As a starting yeah. point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like there's there is like a big jump in quality and in price granted from like say something that you can get complete for 600 bucks to like just over a thousand or like you said that 12 1500 dollar price range yeah yeah i think it has a lot at least for steel it has everything to do with the quality of the tubes that are used as mm -hmm. well that in combination with the with the design and, and manufacturer process i think is everything right um, yeah which is actually the whole process. <laughs> <laughs> but what I mean is like, there's a big jump between like a lower grade, you know, straight gauge steel tube set versus like a nicer higher end, higher quality alloy butted tube, you know, butted tube set. Um, yeah. Yeah. I would, I would agree. But you're mentioning like the, you know, the, the all cities and the, that kind of marin those kinds of brands but my mind is actually going to uh, hardtail mountain bikes right now because oh, i i built up the kona hanzo earlier last year and i've done several several videos on that um but you know i'll let my buddies ride it and, and they're the first thing they always comment on is how harsh it rides mm -hmm. and i kind of noticed that right from the beginning it doesn't feel like a particularly soft hard tail <laughs> um and, and then i also rode um in that same year i rode a demo of the new house um metalworks uh, hummingbird um, hard tail mm -hmm. um alex in the comments this is a hanzo st which is the steel version it's a frame set you can get for like six seven hundred bucks and oh, okay it's just stout like it's built to be like really tough and, and you can really feel it like it's pretty harsh and especially in the in the rear end um yeah i rode the hanzo which is i'm sorry i rode the hummingbird which is um, a new house frame super high end really nice um everything like high quality build 
super nice tube set. And honestly, like that, it felt like I'm not exaggerating. It felt like a like an XC full suspension bike somehow. Like it was just oh, really wow. compliant and soft. So that's where my mind goes when I think about like steel as a material. Um, What's the what was the price difference between the new house and yeah, the, so the <laughs> new house frame will run you about I, somewhere in in the ballpark of twenty two hundred dollars. Okay. Just for, the, for the frame alone, no fork. Um, and then right. the Hanzo is on the order of 600 bucks. And yeah. there's a big difference. There's a big difference for sure. Yeah. I think um, like one brand um, that that to me hits that nice price point and kind of sits on um, that curve of diminishing returns is Richie. Mm. You know, you could spend more and go fully custom, but at that point, you know, you're, you're, you're spending for the, the custom experience, but, uh, most of the gains that you're going to get from like a nicer tube set or, or geometry you've, you've hit when you've, um, you know, like I was a big fan of the Outback and the, the Ascent yeah. and those were both like sub 2000, uh, they were on like the, the 1500, $1,600 mark. Right. That's the, that was the company I had in mind when I threw out my number. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, the Alphac is a carbon fork, right? Mm -hmm. But the That's Ascent true. is a steel fork. Yeah. And, and the Ascent rode pretty nice. Like, I, I really uh, appreciated the ride quality of the Ascent. Mm -hmm. And that steel frame, steel fork, um, you know, the quote-unquote legendary Richie steel, um, <laughs> which is legendary because of its budding profile in the alloy that they use. Um, yeah. And, yeah, you can certainly feel the difference, so... Um, I, yeah. I think the video I'm going to put out next is it's going to be called something on the on the order of not all steel is real or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's, yeah. Steel is not just one entity, right? Just like I'm always saying everything exists on a spectrum. Well, steel as a material also has variations in the alloys and in the in the build process. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. So I think we're both in agreement, at least for, you know, steel frame, steel fork, carbon fork, uh, that 1500 to $1,600 range is kind of that sweet spot. And beyond that, um, you're paying for, you know, some, if, if it's like a built from scratch, custom made to you, um, then that's where you'd get costs and you could argue that that adds a lot of value. Um, you know, you're paying for whatever brand, if it's a fancy builder or like a very bo boutique brand, then, uh, there's some of that cachet, but like for, uh, for instance, like, um, Laura's breadwinner is custom. Is that a custom geo? Yeah. Like ballpark. What was that frame set run for? Uh, that was like low twos for the okay. frame set. And now uh, is that a steel fork? Yeah. Steel okay. fork. It's made by Chris Iglehart, who's you know we're paying we're paying for the name. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, they did a fit with her. Um, yeah, and you know it was the whole custom process. Like she picked the colors and all that yeah. stuff. So, so like you're paying a lot for the experience and the service and the the custom geo, right? Yeah. Was that what was it worth it? For her, <laughs> uh, for her, it's worth it. Um, everyone's freaking about a, about my fake bouquet here, so I'm going to turn it off. <laughs> um, but she's, you know, she's the kind of person where, you know, she just she's fine, completely fine with just one bike. Uh -huh. uh, so you know, she knew what she wanted and, and she got what she wanted. I, on the other, other hand, would probably be a terrible customer. <laughs> for a custom bike, uh, just because, you know, I have kind of strong preferences on some things and, um, yeah, it'd be a nightmare. <laughs> I got you. I got you. So in some instances going full, going all in on one bike could be worth it. If that's your kind of one and only forever bike, I guess. Right. Yeah. I'd also have, you know, there are like some weird geometry, geometry things I'd want to try and I would just, if it didn't turn out well, I'd, you know, that's just a lot of money wasted and yeah. you know, <laughs> just be angry. <laughs> I don't, you don't go custom to experiment with geometry, right? No, I mean, you, you shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> you, you should you probably have a, a fair idea of 
you know, that's going to ride pretty well. Um, I mean, I guess you could, if you had, if you had money to burn, but yeah. Yeah. yeah Melissa, that's a good point. Like red winners made in the U S so that's another thing. If you're paying, are you paying for U S made versus mass produced overseas? There's, there's a difference there too, as well. Yeah. That's actually going to be, um, the subject of a podcast that I'm going to be doing next week. Hmm. Uh, Adam, you, you know, Adam Sklar, mm -hmm. Um, so he, I think this is like the, the first year he's had production bikes in Taiwan mm. and he actually went and visited the factories like two weeks ago. Right. He uh, went so with, we're, we're, yeah. He went with Daniel from new house. He was telling me about that. That's cool. Yeah. So we're going to, um, yeah. Talk about that experience. What, what insights he, he came away with. So it should be interesting. Cool. That'll be exciting. Yeah. Um, all right. So what's, uh, which, what should we talk about next? I think like wheels. Yeah. Okay. Um, should I go first again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wheels, like the way I see it for wheels, there's like a very, I feel like there's a very steep kind of roll off. In other words, there's like a very kind of narrow region where you really optimize your value per dollar spent and then anything after or before that it really drops off quick in my opinion so yeah um for wheels i i am a sucker for carbon um uh for for a number of reasons because not just the weight because you can get alloy wheels to come down and weight too but for carbon you know you can shape it's much easier to shape the profile of the rim um, into any shape that you want. So if you want slightly deeper section or, or whatever, it's, it's just a lot easier to do with carbon. Um, I think the prices have come, come down a lot on carbon wheels and the production process has, has kind of matured a lot over the past few years. So for me, like that, I don't know what, what I have some, something in my mind says like a thousand to $1,200 for carbon, carbon. wheel set. Yeah, carbon yeah. wheel set is kind of like peak value per dollar. Anything above that, you're probably paying for, you know, arrow gains. <laughs> Got to put the air quotes up there. You know, yeah. mark, you're paying for a lot of marketing, and you're probably paying for ceramic bearings, which the average person is probably never going to see the true benefit of. Yeah, that's my take. Yeah, um, yeah, I'd, I'd agree. That's about that sweet spot too. Um, yeah, I'm thinking of like the the Logos wheels. Yeah, hit that uh, price point. I think the the Hunt carbon ones. Yeah, are there or might they might be a little bit less? And I feel like didn't Envy have a carbon wheel set that was around a thousand bucks? I think so. Uh, yeah, their their budget carbon wheel. Yeah. yeah. Um, that said, I'd only probably explore the the brands that offer some kind of uh, warranty or you know, something, some kind of service, because that's still like a lot of money to be, you know, out, out of pocket if something goes sideways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we also start to see is a lot of, a lot of the wheel companies are, are changing up their hub design to, to, to emulate the uh, DT Swiss, the ratchet design, mm -hmm. so like all the, if you bought like a set of mid range, like hunt wheels, you know, five years ago, they would have all been Paul based, but now a lot of the companies are switching over to the uh, star ratchet design because, mm -hmm. you know, the, whatever the patent recently expired. So all the companies are jumping in on that design because it's super bomb proof and reliable and easy to service and all that. So that's just another reason that you don't have to pay top dollar for like some super high end DT Swiss wheel. You can even get like star ratchet hubs at that mm -hmm. price point, which I think is a good thing. Yeah. I like that design. <laughs> yeah. yeah the, the, I think we've had, the, we, we've talked about this before. Like, and I like it for like a really silly reason. It's because sometimes I'll pull out the, remove the cassette and it pulls off the free hub body. Yeah. And with other wheels, like I'll be picking Paul's off the carpet. Oh yeah. yeah. That's, <laughs> that's the same thing here, like the, the, the pieces are much larger. <laughs> yeah. That's the same exact reason. Um, I mean, some some of the older Paul hub designs, I don't know. They retain the free hub a little bit e better, so you can pull the cassette off. But 
Yeah, I've got some wheels where if I just set the wheel down on the ground wrong, like the whole cassette and free hub falls off and there's paws yeah. all over the floor. So yeah, I forget if it was that I was talking to you or someone that had a bike shop, but he had a, a customer or friend that um, was taking a wheel set to the shop and he had strapped it to his uh, backpack with the with the cassette on. And somewhere along the ride, like the cassette and the free hub just like oh, ejected no. itself. <laughs> oh, man. That's a bummer. That's Our, a total you, replacement. You can't really. No one's going to yeah. stock that same free hub. <laughs> yeah. Are Paul's, um, again, we're P-A-W-L-S, not P, not Paul as in Paul components. Right. Are Paul's standardized or does each like free hub manufacturer use a different Paul profile? <laughs> do you I know? don't know. I don't know. So, Cause I've always wondered like, what do you do if you, if you lose some and yeah. you know, how do you track down a replacement? Right. So. I, I, I feel like they're not standardized, but I can't confirm that. Yeah. Um, I only say that because I remember my buddy, like this is a long time ago. My buddy had a set of the Mavic Sirium road wheels. You know, it's like the harsh alloy wheels. And like he was servicing his hub and like the whole thing exploded. Paul's went everywhere. <laughs> and the springs, I remember picking up springs, the, the little Paul springs. And I think they were like, I think they were actual coil springs. Mm -hmm. That like sat between the Paul and the free hub, but I can't can't be certain. But anyways, like on some of the different, yeah, I've got an, a bunch of other Paul based hubs, and and they're like kind of like leaf springs now. So the spring oh, design is different. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, the like the number of points of engagement, as well as the number of Pauls themselves, are you know they vary from from brand to brand. So right. I'm inclined to say they're not standardized, but I can't can't be certain. Another reason the the star ratchet system rules, because <laughs> I imagine they're they're hopefully all gonna, you know, use use it somewhat as a standard and not deviate too much. Because yeah. the the new logo stuff is supposed to be compatible with um, the DT with Swiss. The DT Swiss, yeah, yeah, it is, yeah, it is, yeah. How about uh, so we talk carbon wheels? You know, eleven hundred, twelve hundred is that point of uh, diminishing returns. How about alloy? I don't, um, yeah, okay, so alloy wheels, what do I have? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go hunt. here, like, I, I feel go like ahead. the hunt wheel set that I reviewed uh, during the pandemic was pretty good. <laughs> was that the 650B adventure wheels? Yeah, 650B adventure wheels, and the weight was, like, in that 1500 gram range, and at yeah. the time, they were selling them for less than 500 bucks. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know that's almost as light as um, some carbon wheels. It's or it's approaching approaching there, right? Um, so if, if you're looking at weight per per price, um, it's hard to beat. And they've they've lasted me um, at least two or three years. I know you know Hunt gets mixed reviews from some bike shops, but in my experience, they've been they've been pretty mm -hmm. solid. Yeah, I've got those same wheels on the Diverge. Now, I haven't had any issues with them. Uh, they've stayed, for the most part, they've stayed straight and spoke tension. Like, the build quality is really good from Hunt. Um, that's another thing, too, that you're paying for. Like, <clears throat> you know, brands, different brands have different, you know, manufacturing and, and QC processes. And I think Hunt does a good job getting pretty consistent builds out the door. Um, and yeah. I'm only saying that because I've got, like, I probably got like five or six pairs of, of hunt wheels in the garage <laughs> and they're all they're yeah. all solid they all they all kind of held tension well they're relatively straight and um, yeah good value um, on the outback yeah. i have a set of the uh, richie zeta uh, zeta mm. gx wheels mm -hmm. and like for the money like those are in the 400 dollars range i think like oh, dang. Low to mid, yeah. i think low to mid 400s if not a little bit less and those yeah. have held up great yeah. What's the um do you know what the weight is? Are they those are like six sixteen hundred grams or thereabouts? A little bit I want to say it's a little more. The the Richie yeah. Zeta GX disc. I don't I can't remember the I think it's on the order of seventeen under eighteen hundred grams, I think. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know the exact number, but not incredibly heavy. You know, like a set of stock wheels that you would pull off any like mid mid-range gravel bike over 
over two kilograms, I think, on average. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, I'm trying to figure out what the current price on the hunt wheels are. Cause I feel like that's, they're a bit of an anomaly. <laughs> yeah. You know, I can't think of another brand that, that hits that, um, that weight for that price in, in alloy. Um, yeah. because like the other ones, like the JRA wheels, those are all carbon. They're just riding along. Those are carbon. Mm -hmm. And then the, um, scribe is all carbon too, I think. Right. Yeah. So I'm looking on the hunt site. They've got a sale hunt gravel race wheel set 14, 1400 grams for 486 euro. Um, it's not so bad. That's, yeah. It's about 500 bucks us. Is it? Okay. Um, yeah. So again, not sponsored. We're just talking off the cuff here. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I feel like that's like a pretty good value. Like if you're, if you're on the budget and you're willing to take a, a risk on hunt, um, you know, like my experience has been good. Yours has been good. People have, other people have not had good experiences. Then I feel like that's a interesting way to go. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you're not set on carbon, there's, there's really, honestly, like I, I think I'm been affected by just marketing. Like I haven't got that <laughs> out of my system yet. Like slowly all my carbon frames are starting to be replaced by metal frames, <laughs> but the wheels are still for the, for the most, for a large part, um, I got a lot of carbon wheels here. Um, yeah. So I don't know. It could I just know. be, could be for no other reason than I've just been trained that way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, someone else mentioned the brand Scribe. Um, are you familiar oh, yeah. with them? Yeah, yeah. So Scribe, um, I learned about Scribe from Mike's channel, actually, I think. Okay. Um, locked in. Yeah. Um, I think he had like some scribes on, on some of his builds. Um, so they seem like a decent mid range carbon offering. But I didn't know yeah. they had alloy as well. Yeah. Let's see. So their alloy, their 650B is 1675 grams. Um, what's it cost? Uh, <clears throat> doesn't have the price. Oh, wait. 340 bucks or 340 euro. Um, not bad. Yeah, so it sounds bad like between thing. four, 500 bucks is kind of that sweet spot for alloy. Huh? Yeah. You can definitely go more. Like there's a, there's a wheel company in, in Oregon, Astral. Have you heard yeah. of them? Yep. Kind of related to Rolf Prima. Um, they use like wide industry hubs and, um, you know, their own rims. And those will get up there. Uh, I think like the polished wheel sets with the white industry hubs is like around twelve hundred. Okay. So, so not yeah. cheap. Head head is another one, right? They they um they have their like Emporia line of of, of alloy wheels. Yeah. But those get up over a thousand bucks as well. Um, I really wanted yeah. those for the Outback because they have a, a polished version. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I couldn't justify like the additional, it would have been like an extra thousand dollars out the door. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah. So let's talk uh, tires since we're on the, the rotating parts of the bike here. Um, tires have gonna ask you, super gonna expensive ask in the last couple of years. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Uh, I was going to ask if, if you could think of any components where there is no point of diminishing return. And, and for me, I think t tires might be the one thing that I'm always okay kind of spending more than I normally would. I don't know about right. you. Um, I, I agree to some extent, although when you buy two of them... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. One tire, one tire isn't so bad, like, you know, but like when you get the pair, which, which most, most do, it, it gets expensive pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like there's this ceiling. There's, there's like this magical ceiling at around a hundred dollars, right? I don't mm -hmm. see it like even high end bike tires. I, I can't think of any that I've seen that cost more than a hundred per tire. So that would yeah. be kind of like a ceiling. And even at that point, you know, in a lot of cases, I think it could be worth it just because of the ride feel that it offers or like if it's a mountain bike tire, just like, you know, the the traction that you get from it or the wear rate from it. Um, yeah. 
yeah. I mean, it, it is the place. Like, I, if you're going to spend money on on something on the bike, the the tires are a good place to do it. Um, I'm looking at the current prices of some Renaeurs tires, so they range <laughs> anywhere between seventy five on the low end to ninety six dollars. Yeah. Um, so just under that that hundred dollar threshold. <laughs> yeah. And um, for for standard tires, like Melissa is talking about, studded tires, which can get pretty pricey. But for standard tires, I don't, I don't foresee myself spending more than a hundred per tire. But I do have a one pair that I ride uh, of Renee Hurst tires, and they're, they're they're pretty good. They're pretty good. Yeah, um, I definitely think Renee Hurst is worth it. I don't often purchase those. I find like I get. 85 90 percent there with like the semi casaderos for for what i like to do and those come in i think like 50 or 60 dollars a tire mm. um it's funny I, I actually ran into um uh, han rossman he used to be a contributor over at bicycle quarterly oh. and we were having brunch uh, and he, he was involved with their early tire testing and i had you know we're talking tires and his sleeper favorite is the VeloFlex tires. Uh, they're handmade in Italy. And okay. I always assumed that they were super expensive, but he's like, no, nah, you can get them for like 50 bucks. And I was like, well, oh, <laughs> yeah. Do they have um, like a wide range of sizes? They don't. That's a, that's a problem is he's trying to convince them to make, you know, wider tires. Um, mm. I think they probably only go into the thirties in terms mm. of width, but, um, yeah, for a handmade Italian tire, super supple, you know, 50 bucks is is pretty dang good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but those yeah. are like road, more like road oriented, road specific yeah. tires, right? Yeah. So Melissa says uh, challenge tires are also cheap in Europe and handmade. Um, mm. Have you, I've not tried too many challenge or any challenge tires. Have you had any experience with them? I think one time I rode a set of challenge tires. I don't, I can't remember anything about them though. Um, yeah. A lot of mention of Terravail. Yeah. yeah. I've got, I've got a bunch of Terravail tires and I like them too for, for the, for the, like if, if the tires had a peak, I would say <laughs> that like maybe 50 to $65 range is kind of where it's at, mm -hmm. uh, which is where like Terravail kind of falls in um, as well as, um, also the pan eraser stuff. Yeah. Terrapel is a great tire. Um, and they're widely available. Like they're, Q, they're a QBP brand, right? So that's yeah, another right. advantage for them. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like a Terrapel will get you, I don't know, 75, 80% there, um, mm -hmm. compared to Rene Aris, uh, in terms of performance and existential doubt. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you I can like buy two of them for the, the price of one tire. <laughs> <laughs> I like Terravail for mountain bikes mostly. Yeah. I've got one pair of the Sparwoods, the 650B tires on the on the Hunt 60 650B wheels. I like them mostly for gravel, but I do feel like they roll a little bit slow for some reason. And I don't know if it's a function of the wheel diameter, something mm -hmm. psychological, or the actual rubber compound. But that's been my experience with the with the Sparwoods. Otherwise, I mm -hmm. like them as far as grip. Uh, they're not too noisy, but yeah, on the road, they just feel a little bit, a little bit slow. Yeah. I've used their Washburn, which I think is similar to like the WTB byway. So kind of uh, mixed terrain, but a little bit on the, um, on the smoother high center. And also, gosh, what's the name of the other one? Like I had a 2.4 inch tire of theirs with like a tan sidewalls. Um, Cannonball? So the it wasn't the cannonball. I feel like it started with a C though. Um, but I had those on the Jones bike when I had it. Was it a, uh, like a gravel or like a mountain? No, it's like, it's a, it's a mountain bike tire. Oh, mountain I bike. also, yeah, I also ran it on the, the PLA. Uh, what tire was it? I feel like it started with a C. The Honcho or the A-line or the common ones or the Kessel. Is there a grass? Uh, the Coronado. Yeah, Coronado. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Melissa with uh, all the facts today. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, the Coronado, that was a fun one. It was very bouncy. <laughs> oh, really? Um, yeah. yeah. So under 100, you're saying that's that's about the, the line that uh, well, you Well, I think cross under or... 100, yeah, under 100 is just kind of the entire range. I don't know if too many tires right. are <laughs> more than 100. Um, yeah. But but even given that, I'm I'm more willing to pay 100 per tire than like, 2000 on a set of wheels or something like that you know yeah yeah i think you'd get more more bang for buck with the, with the tire there yeah okay um so we should move on to more controversial items <laughs> like drivetrains <laughs> headsets no oh, headsets <laughs> 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 what is because i feel like there's a, such a big range here um sure what a headset costs like what is you know i have a friend uh he goes by road holes on uh, instagram <laughs> and he's like you know if you're riding like a road or gravel bike you're not doing bar spins you know you're, <laughs> you're the, the the amount of uh the angles that you're actually turning are, are very narrow so you don't need yeah. like the most super precise bearings um right. Plus or minus ten at, degrees is all you need. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I think you should go first on this one. Uh, uh, I have a hard time spending more than fifty dollars on a headset, <coughs> and I've been known to spend as little as like thirty dollars, <laughs> and be completely okay with it. <laughs> Just find some loose ball bearings and throw them in there yourself. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, like what, what do the, the cane creeks, um, those are like around 50 bucks. And I feel yeah. like that's, you know, for me, it's like I could spend more, but at that point it's either because of the brand or the anodizing. <laughs> the color, yeah, you're paying for the, the color. color is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, and Laura, Laura's had, uh, you know, uh, Chris King, on her bike, mm -hmm. um, I probably the the fanciest headset I ever put on the personal bike is like a White Industries, which is close but not as much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Where do you stand on on the headset? I, I'm, a, I'm a little <laughs> torn because on some bikes, and this is very personal, but uh, aesthetics matter to me. Each person, I would say. <laughs> And when you have like a matching anodized headset and a seat post, it just, it's like Big Lebowski. It's like the rug, you know, it ties everything together. And um, right. <laughs> sometimes it's worth an extra $75 or more <laughs> to get that, but, but not always, but not like yeah. fu functionally, I would agree. Like uh, a cheap $40 headset is going to do the same thing as a $200 custom anodized, you know, headset. Yeah. And and you're never gonna know the difference, um, and, unless you are doing bar spins. And even if you're doing bar spins, you're not <laughs> holding the handlebars while you're turning them. You're just throwing them around. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Alex uh, mentioned the Wolf Tooth headset, which is another great option uh, made in the U.S. Uh, one thing that I love about the Wolf Tooth store is you can search by color. Yeah. You right. know, so you can say. Per, show me all the purple things you have, and then yep. bam, you can get the the headset, the hubs, you know, the little uh, rack bolts, uh, yep. seat collar, which I, I think is like absolutely brilliant on their part. Yeah. So um, they found that gap. They realized people were paying a lot of money for the color, and they just went in on that. Um, FSA is another you know kind of company that that does a lot of OEM stuff, and th their headsets are just fine as well. Um, yeah. Didn't they? Was it them or, or Kane Creek that came up with the the headset? They had, I thought it was FSA. They, okay, yeah. Like back when Threadless was just starting? Yeah, that was... I, I want to say it's FSA, but I'm not entirely yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Michael Mann, fan of Chris King. Um, it is true. It'll probably be the last headset um, you'd ever buy. Um but I'm also, that's where, I'm, that's one part where I know that's true, but I'm going to economize there uh, until I start making uh, Seth, Seth buy CAC money or burn peak money. <laughs> Just around the corner. <laughs> right. The next yeah, only like, really... uh, only like, uh, you know, 800,000 more subscribers around the corner. <laughs> right. Um, 
Mr. Veloshop here says, uh, Wolf Tooth, uh, best bang for buck, but Chris King is the best. Uh, yeah, I'm glad people mentioned Wolf Tooth. I forgot about their whole color picker thing. I mean, if yeah. you're if you're buying on the aesthetics and want you know, a good quality headset, that's another another way to go because you can get all the the matchy bits. Yeah, for um, for the people who love who swear by Chris King, nothing against them. I'm just wondering why. Like, you know, like why? It's it's does it is it because of the precision of the the balls that they use? Is it the in house manufacturing? Is it you know what is it? Because I've felt Chris King headsets and they spin just as well as a brand new Wolf Tooth. Mm -hmm. So I'd be curious to see you know precisely why it is people believe Chris King is the best. Um, mm -hmm. Just only because I don't have a lot of experience with the brand. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't have any on any personal bikes. I couldn't tell you. <laughs> um, I, I will say for, for spinny things, bottom brackets, I would go the opposite direction. I, I do you think go it's cheaper. No, oh, no, no, no. More you... expensive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm okay to spend a little bit extra on a, a more decent bottom bracket with, you know, better seals and, and, presumably better bearings right because whereas a headset never even makes one full rotation <laughs> <laughs> your cranks are making thousands of full uh, rotations yeah um, and it's closer to the ground where all the dirty stuff is so the bottom bracket yeah. is you know unsung hero i think on the bike and i think if you never deal with like a gross crusty bottom bracket then you know it really did its job so yeah I agree. That's that's uh, uh, the hidden part that does a ton of work. Um, yeah. Which, yeah. Yeah. Uh, someone had mentioned handlebars, so okay. let's go there because handlebars do get really spendy. They do. Um, that's is, right. Is there a threshold for you on the handlebar front? Oh, dollar amount wise, I. I mean, I find it hard to spend more than a hundred, hundred fifty bucks on handlebars. But having said that, I have demoed some really nice, expensive, you know, carbon-shaped, you know, aero handlebars, and there is a difference. I, I don't know yeah. if it's you know worth four hundred dollars in some cases, but um, but I do think that maybe that sweet spot, sweet spot, is around a hundred. 150 um yeah i don't know what it's, you're yeah for me it's a place i'm willing to spend a little bit more just because it can uh it determines the fit a lot yeah. right um you're Are always we... touching it <laughs> you know if there's gonna be yeah. a place i'd spend money it'd probably be i'd probably spend more money on the handlebar than than like a headset <laughs> yeah <laughs> sure. um I probably, you know, the anything over a hundred would give me pause. Um, but fortunately, most of the bars I like are, you know, not over a hundred. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, it's shape because people buy handlebars for a couple of reasons, right? It's the, the shape that they like personally, and then it's the like the compliance or the feel potentially that's built into it. And yeah, then there's, of course, arrow, which for me is like lowest of all priorities. Um, and yeah. I think you don't necessarily need to spend a lot to get the shape you want. Um, but you probably will be spending a little bit more if you want like, you know, ergonomic flat tops or carbon mm -hmm. bars with like, you know, that are meant to be a little bit more soft and, and compliant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it also depends on if you're talking curly bars or alt bars. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because there are some, you know, in terms of shapes that are very like unique and only single manufacturers make that, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, that that degree of bend and sweep and, and all those things. So yeah. you're kind of at the, at the mercy if you want that particular bar. Right. Um, I feel like you might be referring to like the Doom bars or the Monet bars. Yeah, or, um, you know, like uh, Crest had the Harvey Mushman bar, which is kind of interesting when it first came out because it had, it was one of the first, um, you know, it had like a 25 degree ish bend, a good amount of rise, but also had a wide, I don't know, center part because it was designed specifically to have bags on it. 
Mm-hmm. And, and at that time, is one of the first mountain bike slash clunker bars that had that dedicated space for a bag. Now, now more, um, now there are more bars like that, um, like the Richie Buzzard bars. Yeah, they those have a much wider central area than than the uh, Coyote bars, Coyote bars. Um, and I think specific, that might might have been specifically because of bags. Mm. Are are those out yet? The buzzer? Uh, I got I got a pair. Oh, you got. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're they're released to the public. They might just be. Yeah, this is like a prototype pair. I'm gonna oh. do a video on the alt bars. Nice. Um, yeah, and I'm still I haven't mounted it yet, but uh, comparing it side by side with the coyote and the uh, Soma Dreamer bars that, I, uh-huh. that I've got on the Riv. I have um, a prototype. I, I I think I can talk about it, but I can't mention it. Like Redshift has something new coming out as well, which which I have is is pretty interesting as well. So, yeah, like I think handlebars, much like saddles, are very much personal preference, and I don't know if there's like a direct correlation, like a dollar amount to like I feel like that value per dollar spent curve for handlebars is is very personal. Whereas right. for other components, it may be more universal. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Melissa had asked uh, who makes BBs in the US, <clears throat> and Michael Mann had answered Chris King, White Industries, make BBs in the US. So thanks, Michael, for that. Um, what else? Have you tried Vibracore? Like I have. Okay. Uh, there was, what's it called? The the Tanglefoot uh, hardtack that um, that they sent sent over to review had Vibracore handlebars and uh, wheels. Oh, and the wheels were super plush. <laughs> I was uh, I almost bought a pair of, of uh, Vibracore wheels after testing that bike because it was yeah. like whoa, <laughs> um, and they were and they were pretty light. Uh, the bars. I don't, I don't remember them standing out too much. Um, I noticed the wheels more than I did the, the handlebars. So. Mm. Can we circle back to the wheels? I, had, I always have trouble quantifying or even qualifying wheel compliance. How, what was it that, how could you tell that those wheels were more compliant than others? Um. So given the tire width and the tire pressure I usually run for that width and taking it down the, 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 the trails I would take, um, take it down on in back in Missoula, it just felt like springier and I felt like less beat up, um, after the ride, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, like riding the trail that you've ridden over and over again, <coughs> with the tire tire, you know, like a nominal tire width that you're familiar with and staying at the pressure it just felt I don't know. It's, it's very unscientific. <laughs> no, I'm not grilling. I'm just curious yeah. if you did any like A B testing. Like, did you put, I mean, you probably didn't have time, but like, did you put a different wheel? No, on I, didn't the same do, I didn't do that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'd be curious to see like what the differences are, like direct, you know, direct comparison. You know? If I get yeah. a hold of, if I get a hold of Vibracore wheels, I'll, I'll do that and try it. Yeah, yeah, I'd be curious to uh, your thoughts. Uh, Melissa, Melissa asked, what was the width? It was something like 700 by 50. Um, I forget which tire it was. It was a really supple um, sidewall that I had also, that could have helped. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Can I do the testing? So, yeah, Melissa's requesting testing. I gotta, I can't just get parts. Um, I have to buy them or either beg for them from companies. So <laughs> maybe yeah. I'll reach out to Vibracore and see. There you go. Yeah, I have to. I'm in the same boat. Like, and I'm, and it's 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 worsened by the fact that I'm in Spain. I'm like, the package may get here in a week or three months. <laughs> <laughs> and could you pay that on top of? Uh, oh your right. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. got to be in the. You got to have a clause in there that the companies will pay for. Shipping yeah. there and back. It's yeah, I'm I've I'm including that because there's some brands that have been that have reached out and I'm like, yes, I want to review it, but this is this is a deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um okay, handlebars, wheels, tires, 
frame. Um, what now? <laughs> well, there's basically like drivetrain, brakes, and okay. saddle is really all we haven't talked about. <laughs> all right. Let's do drivetrain. Get it over okay. with. <laughs> Get it over with. Um, $100 for a friction for a Uno shifter. Mm -hmm. There you and go. Be, be done with it. <laughs> <laughs> if you're spending more than $125 for both for for your shifter, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Anyone who doesn't have an Uno shifter, <laughs> suck it. <laughs> uh, no, I I do think for drivetrains again, very much like wheels. I think there's a very sharp peak. I don't know if anyone's getting my reference here, but like the. <laughs> the curve that I'm visualizing for value per dollar spent. I feel like there's a, a very defined middle sweet spot for drive trains. And it's all like the mid range stuff. Like it's for me, it's always been one Oh five for road stuff. It's been GRX 600 for gravel stuff. And it's been like Dior even for mountain bike stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I just, I've tried the higher end stuff. I, I just don't, see it like the shifts maybe are a little tiny bit crispier but that's it like you're not really gaining much else um from spending a ton of money on a drivetrain in my experience yeah um i'm the same way like you know i don't buy complete group sets often <laughs> as i'm sure viewers are aware but for me like i've always been happy with dior um yeah yeah i've tried xt and it's nice but you know, like Dior is perfectly fine for me. Yeah. Um, you know, on the road end, you know, 105, even Tiagra is pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, I tend not to, I guess, look at the tiers of the groups with like a big blanket because I, I have a very strong preference for the gearing. So I look at what, what will give me the range I want. <clears throat> right. And <clears throat> I weigh that more than, I don't know, any like cachet of, of a particular group set. Mm -hmm. Um, so for a good example is like Q's, um, they've got a 4024 crank set, mm. right? But it's on the lowest level of Q's, which totally bones me out. <laughs> <laughs> but I would totally get it because that's, you know, that would be the crank I'd, I'd buy. Yeah. Uh, it sucks that it's like riveted and, you know, it's limited to like the the lowest uh, end of Q's, but, you know, right. what are you going to do? So. Yeah. I don't know. Um I, I wish I had some experience with cues. I just haven't gotten gotten my hands on any yet. Um, you know, I, I, like it. I, I was going to say it's, like Claris is for me probably the point where it starts to really drop off. Um, I got a buddy's bike here that I'm going to do some upgrades on, and he's got a Claris two by. And the thing is, just I've done all I can. Like it's just not. <laughs> <laughs> like it's indexed perfectly fine but every time we go out it's just like his drivetrain's crunching along and you know miss shifts all the time so um maybe brand new claris but this was second hand and so um yeah yeah as far as SRAM so stuff too like gx i think is where it's at it's just all the middle stuff like i've tried xo one and, and xx one like there's just i don't know there's, there's nothing you, you get gold stuff I guess. <laughs> At the higher end. Um, and I don't think we even have to talk about electronic shifting, really. <laughs> right. No. You're just burning your money, people. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Let's see. What, uh, here's another fan for the 105 GRX. Um, yeah. Sora, I kind of forgot about Sora. It's, it's, I think like right out of the, right from the factory, if you set it up perfectly, it can work pretty well. But I just think something about it, it just doesn't last. Like for, for derailleurs, especially like stiffness is one thing that actually does matter because once you get mm -hmm. any flexure in the, in the body of the derailleur or the cage, then, you know, you're just going to get, you know, ticking and, and crunching and all kinds of weird noises from the, from the drivetrain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Another fan of Q's. Yeah. So I've been riding Q's on two bikes. One is the Pelago. It came stock on that. And I put uh, Q's rear derailleur and shifter on my Rivendell. 
mm-hmm. and they both have been working pretty good. Um, what did you? I forgot what you called it. Something about Darth Vader, or Cybertruck, <laughs> or something. Yeah, Darth Vader. It's like if the cyber Cybertruck pooped on the sidewalk, it, it would be a, a Q's uh, rear derailleur. Um, and it still looks like that, but it, it shifts okay. <laughs> it does its job, you know. It's it's very utilitarian. It's you know not to my personal taste in terms of aesthetics, mm. but I mean it does what you want a rear derailleur to do. So yeah, right, right. Yeah. Um, let's see. All right, what else should we talk about in terms of diminishing returns? Uh, let us know in the comments below. Um, someone, there are a couple of people that had mentioned bar tape. Um, mm. is there like, usually when I'm buying bar tape on a personal bike, I just look for some cheap cork tape. <laughs> yeah. I like They're the cheap. salsa stuff just because, you know, the, the back isn't too tacky. I know I can undo it a couple of times and it doesn't eat, uh, eat itself. Um, <laughs> I've been a fan of like the ESI silicone, uh, handlebar tape, uh-huh. although it's a little chunky and smells weird when you first open it, but you know, <laughs> it's super comfy. Yeah. Um, for bar um, tape, I I used to I used to buy that Supercast stuff, the the forty five dollar bar tape, because mm-hmm. I thought it looked cool. But but actually, it's pretty comfortable and um, uh, it's re, it, it's somewhat reusable. Like it doesn't you know rip itself in half when you try and take it off. That's really expensive. But more recently, I've actually been really liking the Richie. Um, I think it's called the Race Richie Race Bar tape it's like there's a little bit of gel in there but i know Mm -hmm. it's just got this really like it almost feels like a suede or like velour or something it's just like really (laughs) soft to the touch and i really like it like it grips really well uh i never slip and and it's you can kind of reinstall it if you want to so that's one that i've really been enjoying actually yeah um yeah tape is tough like i went on a tape testing spree last year because I was really frustrated with getting, you know, some some expensive tape, having to redo something, and it just like tears itself, yeah. you know. And I was like, "That's it." I think it was like a, a physique brand tape, and it just had really strong adhesive. Yeah. Um. So from there, I you know I tried like the grep tape, which is basically a cotton. It's it's almost like a new bombs, but it's got like rubber grippies on the underside. Mm-hmm. And then there's a camp and go slow tape. Um, and the ESI tape. So I was trying those three. I had two of them on the same bike <laughs> just to see which uh, which I would like. And from that, like the ESI kind of bubbled to the top from um, in terms of how it felt. Like it was kind of probably the ugliest of all the tapes, uh-huh. but uh, it felt it felt the nicest. Nice. Um, Michael Mann uh, crank sets. So you and I have both kind of switched to shorter cranks, which makes yeah. it a little problematic or a little bit more more interesting when when shopping for cranks. Yeah. Um, yeah. What you're using the GRX in 165? Yeah, I've got a GRX 165 on one bike, and then I've got a Wide Industries um, 170 on the Outback. So very, yeah. very, very different price points. And honestly, I can't tell. There's no difference. Cranks, yeah. as long as they don't bend, they're <laughs> you don't have to spend a ton on cranks. Admittedly, I spend a lot of money on like I, I've never bought like a super nice crank set before, except for the Outback. And it it looks really nice. <laughs> but, yeah. but it rides just the same as any other. What do what did the GRX cranks cost in 165? Yeah, the GRX crank set was under 150. Okay. And I think I got it on like yeah. bike tires direct or something like that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> really like surprisingly affordable, which I feel like I shouldn't say because they're just going to raise the price, but <laughs> <laughs> everyone buy them now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, You'd have I, to I, wait. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I'm a little bit more particular with the cranks that I, I put on my personal bikes. Like I want a shorter crank. So I like, you know, at least 165, if not like 160, uh-huh. And I like to run two buys, yeah. um, so that kind of narrows the the available field. And the ones that, um, you know, like using a one ten seventy four uh, BCD, yeah. so that's exactly like one one or two cranks. <laughs> uh, 
that that offer that and those cost like 180 so are you is that the dicks now uh, yeah yeah i've been, I've been super happy with, with, with them um so yeah it sounds like i don't know it sounds like they just found this gap in the market and like like they recognize yeah. that people are starting to try a lot of different um sizes so why not just yeah. manufacture a whole bunch <laughs> yeah, like the Caro Supreme, Dixon and LeCranks are great. Got 155. Too bad they don't make square taper. <laughs> uh, spa cycles. Spa cycles in Europe. Square taper, 11074, um, shorter crank lengths. Oh, yeah. I, I, I don't know that they go to 155, mm -hmm. but um, that's an option. Yeah. I like them because they're not square taper because I feel like there are, there are, enough, there are more options uh, going square taper. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, what else? Okay, so we're hitting that hour mark. Um, any anything else you want to discuss? We pretty much hit the. I think we pretty much hit the whole bike, other than like a couple of minor. So someone had mentioned bike bags, and I can see. Let's talk bike bags really quick. We'll wrap it up here because okay. bike bags certainly run the gamut in terms of uh, price. Um, sure, you know. And there are some definitely expensive ones. Like, uh, you know, I like the, the bags by bird bags or bags of that style. And those are small makers and those tend to run, you know, two, two fifty dollar range. Yeah. Uh, for me, they're, they're worth it, but there's, you know, there's, there's definitely a point when it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like the, the bike bags, the handmade stuff, you're really supporting the creator. I think when you, yeah. when you, buy like a nice handmade local bag that's i think really what you're paying for i've like i don't have a ton of super nice bags uh, like mm -hmm. i've got some swift stuff and some oveja negra and um what else do i have uh oh outer outer shell stuff which i think they're all great like i feel like they're never gonna you know they're mm -hmm. gonna last for a long long time uh, but I also have some, like, admittedly, I have some, like, really cheap just Amazon stuff on the kids' bikes. I've got, yeah. like, middle-of-the-road, like, Chrome Industries and, and lead-out stuff on some other bikes. Yeah. And, and they, they all hold stuff um, equally well. <laughs> <laughs> they, they all hold can, stuff. <laughs> yeah, they, they hold stuff pretty well. I've never lost anything. I've never had, like, a bag just disintegrate on me. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think there is some level of aesthetic that you're paying for, as well as like if you have a particular function that you prefer, then you might have to go to like these custom bag makers. Um, I'm probably not the best person to talk to about bike bags in particular. I think that's more your area of expertise. But I've got a whole um, bunch, and I, I think they mostly do the <laughs> job. Yeah, here's another fan of outer shell. Um, my f my favorite my favorite three bags at the moment. Are the outer shell uh, basket bag slash uh, carry all mm -hmm. is really nice. <laughs> it makes yeah. an awesome bag for um, when you're flying. You know, as like a carry on bag. Oh. Um, it doesn't look like a bike bag when you're off the bike. Mm -hmm. Like I feel like some some basket bag, multifunction basket bags still read bike bag, but this mm -hmm. uh, the outer shell one's really well executed. Mm. Um, the or not handlebar bag was a was a surprise to me how much I liked it. We ended up buying another one for for Laura. Oh, cool! Um, and that one was um, fairly affordable. Like someone mentioned, a two liter bar bag uh, from Rafa. The the or not ones less than that for sure. I want to say like six in the sixty seventy dollar range. Hmm. Um, but then you're into sort of mass produced non not hand well maybe handmade but at least not locally yeah yeah um yeah and the third bag i mentioned it in my car free living in spain video is the ortlieb uh, vario bag which is like a painter that converts into a backpack oh yeah and i it, saw that it's a it's the best execution of that idea i've seen like there's so many you know it's been a, a problem like a lot of bag makers have been solving and i think they've done um the best job at it so mm. The key idea there is that the straps are on the opposite side of the, the, like the rack side, right? Yeah. Usually, a lot of people try to put the painter hardware and the and the backpack hardware on the same side, 
So it's kind of compromising both. <laughs> but here, since you have a dedicated pannier side and a dedicated backpack side, there's like no compromise in terms of functionality. Mm. Like you don't have like the pannier hooks digging into your back when you're wearing it as a backpack. Right. You don't have the padded shoulder pads on the pannier side making it too bulky when it's on the bike. Um, so right. it's it's like having a really good pannier and, and a really good backpack. Interesting. So, now for me, yeah. like I may, I've never spoken about this. I might be the only person who does this, but I, I load my backpack strategically. Like my kids <laughs> will just dump everything into the backpack and it's just one like a ob oblong mess. But I always try and like organize it so the flat stuff is against <laughs> my back and I build it out <laughs> so that the shape is nice. It sounds so <laughs> engineery. <laughs> I'm admitting all kinds of stuff. Would that affect it or is there some kind of like rigid backing for the backpack side um on the backpack side there's not like a rigid backing per se but it's got these foam things that stand off from your that keep the bag off your back and that adds oh. some rigidity but it's not like there's not like a solid plate hmm. um it's a little bit more rigid on the on the painter side okay but it's yeah yeah so you might strategically load the bike with the flat stuff towards the outer part so that when it becomes a backpack, it's like nice and well. That when you wear it as a backpack, there is like a there's a a laptop sleeve on the back portion, so you could use a laptop oh, or a, okay. or an iPad or something or some kind of eye device to to create like a flat space. Oh, okay, that's cool. Yeah, that's, I don't. Well, that's just where my mind went when I thought about the flipping the sides is how <laughs> how uncomfortable it might be when you flip it to backpack mode. No, it's actually it's actually when I my first use of, of it was only as a backpack for three days. We took the oh. train down to Barcelona and I had clothes in there and uh camera gear and was using it as like a weekend bag and it worked great for that. Cool. So yeah. yeah engineers are weird, so <laughs> I can disregard some of the stuff that goes through my mind. <laughs> yeah. All right. There's two two hundred and eighteen of you guys still in the chat. Hit that like button there. <laughs> Subscribe to Nolan's channel and, and my channel, all that good stuff before you exit, before you flee the building. <laughs> like someone <laughs> called fire in the movie theater, hit that like button. <laughs> uh, I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, thanks, Nolan, again for, for chatting. Thank you guys for, for listening and, and watching. Uh, hopefully this was entertaining. If you got some value out of it, you know, like, share, subscribe, uh, all that good stuff. And as always, uh, keep this helpful side down.